Hi everybody, welcome to this talk about optimizing auto vacuum, PostgreSQL's vacuum cleaner. I'm Samay Sharma and um, I'm an engineering manager in the open source Postgres team at Microsoft. I've been working with Postgres for about a decade now um, in different roles, doing different things with it. As an extension developer for the Citus extension, I worked on uh, working with a lot of customers who've been using Postgres and Citus and are having performance and scalability issues, talking to them, helping them get the best out of Postgres. And that's where I got the idea for this talk, uh, to talk what I've learned about all these discussions with the customers around a specific topic of auto vacuum. Auto vacuum, uh, sometimes customers know that they have an auto vacuum issue and other times they're having you know, query performance and other issues and then we end up understanding that if we were to make auto vacuum better, it would make their overall database performance better. I'm also learning how to be a parent uh, to my 10 month old daughter. Every moment with her is amazing and I really enjoy this learning experience is the most fun I've ever had learning something. So before we go into auto vacuum and its specifics, I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about what vacuum is, what does auto vacuum do, and then why we need to tune it or what kind of problems we can run into with it. So Postgres, uh, in Postgres, when you update or delete a row, it generally does not just you know, remove the row immediately or uh, you know, update it where it is. It creates a new version of the row uh, so that other connections who have already been accessing the older version of the row can continue to do so. Uh, so if you look at the example we have on the right, uh, we deleted uh, the data one row and we deleted the data three row, uh, sorry, updated the data three row. And that's why those two row versions are now older ones. They are called like dead tuples or obsolete tuples. There are different names uh, people use interchangeably for them. And then the data two and data four are the only two valid pieces of data. But because of this strategy, you end up accumulating a ton of dead tuples. So someone uh, has to come and clean them up to free up space, otherwise your database will constantly keep growing. The process which does that is known as vacuum. You can issue a vacuum uh, manually, and then the result of that would be something like what we are seeing at the bottom with data two and data four, the only two things which remain. You can invoke a vacuum very simply by just typing vacuum and enter, that's pretty much it. Uh, that will vacuum your entire database. However, uh, you know, for more use cases, you might want to vacuum a specific table or you want to vacuum and also freeze certain rows. You may want to analyze with it. So the, it comes with a bunch of options. You can read more about it in the Postgres documentation, but the basic forms of vacuum are just vacuum and then vacuuming specific tables. Now, you can run this vacuum command manually to keep cleaning up your database, but then you have a ton of things to think about. When do I schedule these jobs? Uh, how many jobs do I schedule? Which tables need to be vacuumed when? Because each table is different and the workload you're running through is also different. Uh, when you run the vacuum, you need to decide how fast do I let it go? Do I throttle? Do I not throttle? So all of these decisions, and if you were to write your own scripts and ways to implement this, it becomes very cumbersome, which is why Postgres ships with something called auto vacuum. So auto vacuum is just, think of it like a background process. It wakes up every minute. Uh, by default, uh, the, it is configurable when you want it to wake up with the auto vacuum nap time. And let's say it's set to 60 seconds. It wakes up every minute, checks for which tables need to be vacuumed. And the way it does that is it look, looks at certain parameters, how many rows have changed. And then it tries to decide uh, you know, whether I should trigger vacuum or analyze for those tables. It does both vacuum and analyze. In, the, in this talk, we will focus specifically on vacuum. Um, so it vacuums specifically uh, certain tables and then it goes back to sleep. So it triggers new processes which can do the vacuum job and then it comes back in a minute, does the same check and keeps doing this over and over again. So the job of auto vacuum is just to trigger new vacuum processes to vacuum other vacuum different tables. It's on by default and for good reason, uh, there is very rarely a good reason to turn it off. So please don't turn it off unless you really, really know what you're doing. Now, we think that if we were to just 
switch on auto vacuum, it should just take care of all my vacuuming problems. I should never see any bloat. Um, every table should be clean, etc., etc. However, auto vacuum unfortunately is not magic, at least yet. Um, so you do have to tune auto vacuum. You have to tell auto vacuum how your workload is, how your tables are set up, so that they can, uh, so that auto vacuum can do the job it needs to efficient. As an example, uh, if you have two different workloads, one is a 10 gigabyte database, uh, which is really small on a small machine and very low transaction rate. If you vacuum too aggressively, vacuum will consume most of the resources and your queries will not get resources to execute. That will lead to slow queries. Similarly, if you use a vacuuming setup, which is working well with a small database with a larger one, uh, that will need, lead to excessive bloat because you will not be able to clean up rows as fast as the database is inserting them. And that will lead to too much usage of storage, which leads to slowness. So in any case, if you have a improperly tuned auto vacuum, you're going to be going to get slower queries. So when we look at anybody's vacuum setup, what are the things we look for? How do we figure out what the problems are and how do we solve them? That's what I'm going to focus on. So the first thing we want to do is understand what are the possible problems. There are generally four classes of problems I've seen with uh, auto vacuum setups. One is vacuum is not triggered for your tables often enough. The second one is vacuum is triggered, uh, you know, but it's running very slowly. So it's not able to clean up rows at the rate which you need them. The third one is vacuum is running fine. It also has resources, but even after it completes, your dead tuples are not gone. You still see a good number of dead tuples. And the fourth one, is not necessarily a problem. It's a different type of auto vacuum. It's called a transaction ID wraparound auto vacuum. And it needs to be dealt with slightly differently because it has certain properties which make it special. So uh, mostly uh, these are the four classes of problems. We will dive into each of them, talk about how you figure out whether you have this problem and then how you move on to fixing it. So the first one is vacuum isn't triggered often enough. So when is vacuum triggered uh, by auto vacuum? It's when your number of obsoleted or dead tuples essentially become greater than uh, a particular fraction of the table plus a minimum threshold. We don't need to focus a lot on the threshold. It's just a way to guarantee that, you know, if you have two dead tuples, you don't end up triggering an entire table vacuum for it. It's just like a minimum value. You need to have at least these many dead tuples before vacuum can be triggered. The main factor which decides when it will be actually triggered are the scale factors. So we have one called auto vacuum vacuum scale factor, uh, which is for the obsoleted tuples. And the other is auto vacuum vacuum insert scale factor, which is for tables which have like once you have done so many inserts, auto vacuum will be triggered. The third one is uses auto vacuum freeze max age, but this is related to transaction ID wraparounds, and we will talk about that in the later part of the talk. So, uh, to give you an example of when vacuum will be triggered, uh, let's imagine that you have a row, a table which has 100 million rows. The scale factor is set to 0.1. That means vacuum will be triggered once we have 10 million rows uh, obsolete. Now, what are some signs where, you know, this scale factor is not good enough or where, where vacuum is not being triggered uh, often enough? A few common signs are the bloat or dead tuples are growing more than expectation. Postgres stores all of this metadata about bloat, about the number of dead tuples, you can view them. And the implication of that, if you do not kind of fix this problem for long, you will start seeing slower queries because your bloat is pretty high. Um, so that's another sign you need to look at what's going on. Now, how do you check when the last auto vacuum had run? Uh, there is a table named PG stat user tables, which tells you information about when the last auto vacuum was run and when auto, how many times auto vacuum has been run on that table. And through these, you can figure out what is the rate at which auto vacuum has been. So now that you've seen some of these signs, uh, you want to figure out how to fix this problem. The simple solution to that is to adjust the scale factors according to two things. 
the current size of the table and the growth rate of those tables. So for example, if a table has a billion rows uh, and uh, you've left the parameter for the scale factor to default, it means 200 million rows worth of bloat can be generated before vacuum will clean it up. Now that, as you can guess, can be a lot of bloat, right? Uh, so for tables which are as large as these, you might want to set the scale factors to pretty low values. And depending on the workload, you might be able to tolerate a little bloat or more bloat, but something like 0 0.02 or for heavy intensive workloads, even 0 0.002 might be a good set of values. So now that we've made sure vacuum is getting triggered uh, for your tables at the right time, the next problem comes in, uh, which is you have triggered the vacuum, but it's not completing. Whenever you look at your system, you see some or the other auto, auto vacuum triggered vacuum running, uh, bloat is constantly rising. You're actually adding to more bloat because vacuum is just running slow. Uh, and when you see this problem, there are multiple things you can do to fix it. But the very basic thing you start with is to disable something called cost limiting. So vacuum has a way to uh, you know, put itself to sleep for some time uh, to allow other processes to run. So it might be sleeping occasionally to reduce the total amount of IO it does to give it to your actual workload queries. It does that when it hits vacuum cost limit. So once it does a certain number of operations, it sleeps and then it gets back again and continues where it left off. For databases which have you know, SSDs, uh, which is very common nowadays, it, you might be safe to just switch off cost limiting by setting the cost delay to zero. If you are not comfortable doing that, you might want to increase the cost limit to very high values like 10,000 so that it, even when it does sleep, um, it is after a good amount of work has been done. The next thing, if you have actually many tables, that can also cause this problem, where you're always seeing your database and you're seeing auto vacuum running through it. For that, I would recommend increasing auto vacuum max workers. That will allow auto vacuum to start more vacuum processes at the same time, so you can vacuum three, five, 10 tables at the same time. And that will allow you to run through your bloat faster. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if you're doing this, make sure you do have a decent number of cores because without that, uh, you might kind of overwhelm the database with just vacuum jobs. So uh, this is a good suggestion if you have many large tables and then uh, a good number of cores. Now, once you've done a couple of these things, uh, if you still feel your vacuum is too slow, we might have to dig a bit deeper to figure out what actually is causing the slowness. And for that, Postgres provides PG stat progress vacuum. You can run SQL queries on this table and it can give you information about how many total heap blocks the table has. Heap blocks are actually just the rows where, your, where Postgres stores the rows. So it tells you how many heap blocks you have how many of them have been scanned, how many have been vacuumed already. Um, also, Postgres does vacuuming in kind of phases. Uh, it accumulates the dead tuples, cleans up indexes, uh, and then again kind of repeats those phases multiple times. So that number of phases is actually captured in index vacuum count. So you can look at that and then also uh, you know get ideas on whether it's scanning the heap too slow or whether it's vacuuming the indexes slowly. Depending on what the problem is, you can employ multiple solutions. So if you are scanning your heap too slowly, you can prefetch uh, relations in memory. There are extensions for that uh, PG pre-warm, uh, which can allow you to pre-warm your cache with those tables so that when vacuum runs, it runs quickly. The other option is you can just, in general, use a larger shared buffers that gives you better caching behavior and automatically your uh, tuples might be in memory so you don't need to fetch them uh, from disk while you're doing the vacuum job. If the problem lies with the indexes, uh, one thing you can do is increase max parallel maintenance workers. What does that do? Uh, vacuum actually has the ability to run in parallel with vacuuming of different indexes. So imagine you have a table which has 10 indexes. Now, if you're vacuuming them one at a time, you can imagine that that will take a long amount of time. So to solve for that, uh, you can increase max parallel maintenance workers 
to allow vacuum to vacuum all of these indexes together and complete it fast. Also, if you see the index count to be higher, we talked about that in the previous slide, uh, it means vacuum has to go through many vacuuming cycles. So to reduce that, you can increase the total memory available to store the dead tuples by increasing maintenance work mem or auto vacuum work mem. And then that can be used uh, to store the dead tuples and reduce the number of indexing cycles. So these kind of three or four, these main four main methods should allow you to run vacuum at a much faster pace. Uh, also run it in parallel, also allow it to do less IO and should increase the speed of your vacuum jobs significantly. So now that we've completed these two things, you might be thinking, okay, now I'm good. Vacuum has resources to run. Vacuum is being triggered for my tables. What else can go wrong? One thing which can happen is your vacuum ran, your vacuum completed, you checked your dead tuples and bloat, and it did not come down by much. And you are surprised. Uh, what's going on? Why have my dead tuples not come up? I thought I was done. Well, the reason for that is vacuum, uh, the problem essentially is that vacuum is not able to clean the dead rows even though it ran and it has resources. And the primary reason for that is because someone still needs those rows. What do I mean by someone needs those rows? So when we started this talk, we talked about vacuuming being a way to free up rows which nobody else uh, requires, right? Uh, now, if there are processes which are long running, which are still holding on to rows, vacuum won't be able to uh, you know, clean them up. And so if they are intended, that is okay. But many times you will leave processes behind, which will then cause problems. So what are those uh, things which can block vacuum from cleaning up the rows? There are four of them, and I'll talk about each of them in detail, specifically in each of the slides. Let's start with the first one, long running buckets. Let me explain this one with an example. So imagine that you have a, a connection where you started a transaction 20 hours ago, accessed a few rows, and you forgot to close the transaction, or you just have it running. Now, the rows which are accessed by that transaction, if it were to run more queries on it, it needs to be the older versions need to be accessible because that transaction is viewing that point of time of the database. So for that reason, when vacuum runs, it cannot clean up any uh, rows which are still needed by that transaction. And due to that, uh, you might run a vacuum and it might not clean anything because this transaction needs to see all those versions of those rows. So how do you uh, figure out if this is going on? You find the long running backends. I've included a query for that here. Uh, this one sorts it by transaction age. You can also do it by time and find the oldest queries which have been running. And then once you find them, you can use PG terminate backend to specifically terminate those long running backends so that when vacuum runs next time, it is able to process and free up those rows. Now to avoid running into this problem, you can do a couple of things. The first is you can set a statement timeout so that any statement which takes longer than a particular time gets terminated automatically. Or you could set up a log min duration statement to at least log such statements so you don't have issues, uh, you know, just them kind of staying around forever. You can look at the logs, take action on them, and then terminate them that way. The second class of problems happens when you have a standby. So in Postgres, you have the ability to set up replicas or uh, as they are commonly referred to as hot standbys. When you do that, and uh, by the way, hot standbys also support read statements. So when you do that and you're running read statements, uh, Vacuum has by default the ability to come and clean up the rows. So what you will see is what is called as replication conflicts. So your replica will start running a query and realize vacuum has cleaned up that tuple. So it will throw an error saying the row I wanted to access no longer exists in the database. So you need to retry your query. Now to avoid these replication conflicts, uh, users many times set up hot standby feedback equal to on. That tells the primary don't delete these rows. I'm going to be using these rows for my query. Now that's good because it reduces replication conflicts, but it comes with the side effect of the primary holding rows for the secondary. 
and people often use the secondary to offload queries onto it, the longer running, the heavier queries. So if you have hot standby feedback on and your secondary is running complex queries, it might hold up the rows on the primary as well. So I've included a query which allows you to check the minimum transaction ID which every replication connection needs to hold. Uh, you can query them and see if there are super old transaction IDs which certain replication connections have to hold. Then you can go to that replica, use the same process as we used last time, right? You can uh, cancel those queries so that those rows can be freed up as a temporary solution. To fix this kind of, um, or I should say to avoid this problem from coming up, what you can do is think about whether you actually can deal with replication conflicts. Like, can you retry your queries in certain cases? Uh, and just use hot standby feedback off so that vacuum can just generally keep cleaning up those rows. The other alternative is kind of a midway between both. So not waiting for everything, but not, uh, you know, letting vacuum hold it for as long as it can also uh, is called vacuum defer cleanup age. So there you can specify, okay, right now by default vacuum can just clean up a row if it's not used by anybody. But you say, okay, wait uh, before cleaning that row for an X number of transactions. And only if X number of transactions have passed, do you clean these rows. So that way you buy yourself more time to run those queries on the secondary, but it's not kind of an unbounded time if queries are just running uh, on the secondary for very long. The third is unused replication slots. So we talked about physical replication in the previous slide. So if you have a similar setup with hot standby feedback on, you can run into that issue if the replication gets stuck or if uh, you know the queries get stuck on the secondary. Uh, but this can happen also with logical replication. So when you have logical replication, uh, it, it does not necessarily avoid cleanup of the rows, but it avoids cleanup of the catalog data. So catalog tables are actually Postgres tables, which it uses to find out, you know, which index to use for a query and things like that. So that can lead to slowness because every query needs to refer to the catalog tables. How do you find out which replication slots have older transaction IDs to retain? I've included a query for that here. And once you figure out, you know, let's say you have a logical replication slot where the consumer is down and nobody is consuming results from that replication slot. Postgres is just going to hold those rows, right? So you can just do select PG drop replication slot to clean those replication slots. Or we talked about how to deal with hot standby feedback in the previous slide. Those, those suggestions apply here as it is for physical replication. And the fourth reason why vacuum runs but cannot clean up the rows is uncommitted prepared transactions. So Postgres supports two-phase commit transactions and they allow you to do a commit prepared, uh, sorry, a prepared transaction to prepare your transaction and then you can do a commit prepared to actually commit it. Now these transactions, because they are two-phase commit, they are resilient, they are meant to handle database failures. So uh, if nobody issued a commit or a rollback on those transactions, they will be kept around. And again, the rows which those transaction needs cannot be removed. So I would suggest running this query to find the old prepared transactions, use rollback prepared uh, to roll those ones which you don't need to or just commit them if you need to commit them and kind of free up those for auto vacuum to trigger a new vacuum which can clean up these transactions. So whenever you see the problem we described before, these are the four queries I would run to figure out which of these are holding back the rows and then apply the appropriate solution to clear them up. Now there's another possible reason why vacuum is you know, triggered, has resources, but is still not doing its job. It is because of things which can cause vacuum to uh, you know, terminate itself, which is uh, locks. So if vacuum knows that it is a kind of maintenance job, it is not the primary job, so if there is DDL activity uh, which is running, it will try to acquire the logs. It will figure out, okay, this table is being changed, so I cannot acquire those logs, and it will terminate itself. So that way, if you have, you know, for example, DDL queries running all the time on your database, your vacuum will start. It will see, okay, there's something more important going on. Let me terminate myself, and that will keep happening, and that will lead to rows not being vacuumed. So these are actually, uh, once you have all of these three things done, 
uh, your vacuum should be healthy in every normal uh, cases, right? Uh, you should be able, it should be triggering, it should be running. When it runs, it should actually be able to do the work it's designed to do. The fourth category of common questions I hear is around transaction ID wraparounds. What are transaction ID wraparounds and why are we talking about them differently than the other vacuums? Because they are special in a sense. They exist for a specific purpose and they also have, because of that, they also behave differently than the other vacuums. So many times you will be surprised, okay, normally I do this and this works, but why am I not able to make it work when this particular vacuum is running? And that's because of transaction ID wraparound vacuums. I'll briefly touch upon what they are. Uh, so Postgres transaction IDs are limited to 32 bits, which means that you have 2 power 32 transactions whose history you can store. So you can say these are the older transactions, a transaction which has an ID of you know 2000 happened later than the ID which uh, then the transaction which has an ID of 1,500, right? But what happens when you reach 2 power 32 transactions? And if you have a database which is running for long, you will run into that limit at some point. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So when that happens, if we do not do anything, then database cannot take in more rows because it cannot move a new row into zero and make it in the past, even though it is in the future. So for that reason, vacuum also freezes certain rows, which will be visible to everybody so that it can reuse this transaction ID space for new rows. So it says, okay, all of these transactions happened far in the past. Everybody should be able to see them. So we don't need to necessarily check if this is in the past or the future. Let me just mark this as frozen. And to enable that, like normal auto vacuum also freeze, uh, freezes things. So it's not that you need a transaction ID wraparound vacuum to freeze things. But let's imagine that a table has not been vacuumed at all. Then once you reach auto vacuum freeze max age, uh, number of transactions since the last frozen transaction ID, then it will trigger a wraparound over here. So by default, if a table is not vacuumed, a wraparound vacuum will be invoked once every freeze max age minus vacuum freeze min age transactions. I also said that these transactions are different. Uh, these vacuums are different. Why are these vacuums different? For a few reasons. One, they are aggressive vacuums. So they actually access more pages than what a regular vacuum would do. They trigger, uh, because their purpose is to freeze rows, right? So they will try to freeze more rows if they can. If you did not listen to my advice in the beginning of the talk, or you are completely an expert on vacuum and you know uh, you know, I just want to turn it off for this particular specific period where I'm doing an operation, you will still see this transaction ID wraparound auto vacuum pop up and then you will be like, okay, what happened? So be careful that they can run even when auto vacuum is off. They restart if they are canceled. And we talked just a couple of minutes ago about DDLs blocking, uh, like vacuum canceling itself for allowing DDLs to run. This one will not do that. So if you have a DDL waiting to capture logs, the transaction ID wraparound auto vacuum will need to complete before the DDLs can run. Because of these reasons, you need to keep a few things in mind to manage. One is, as I said, these vacuums are more aggressive. So if you see them all the time, uh, you know, uh, you might want to increase the freeze max age so that this type of auto vacuums run less, less frequently. The second thing is you should set up monitoring for progress towards freeze max age and towards transaction ID wraparounds and take action on them by manually running vacuum when those triggers are, uh, when those alerts are triggered. Postgres is also trying, will also try to warn you once you get closer to the, you know, filling up your transaction ID space. It will say, uh, you know, give you this particular warning saying that you must vacuum this database please execute a database-wide vacuum immediately if that is happening because there might be a reason why the previous vacuums were not able to free up rows. You might have to figure that out and trigger a database-wide vacuum. Lastly, understand that transaction ID wraparound vacuums are different because of these couple of reasons we discussed in the previous slide um, and manage accordingly. So if you have DDLs, which always expect to be able to run, understand that this vacuum can block them. If you have auto vacuum switch to off, uh, understand that this vacuum can still pop up, so on and so forth. 
So now we've talked about all the main things which I've seen over the years working with customers on auto vacuum. And the key takeaways are auto vacuum should be able to solve most of your bloat problems. So don't think that you have to resort to manual vacuuming if your auto vacuum is not working as expected. Uh, you need to configure it to make sure it's running often and running fast enough. You need to make sure that it's able to do its work and clean the tuples. You need to manage the transaction ID wraparound vacuums uh, so that it runs and cleans up and freezes your rows, but it also does not slow down uh, your system and your workload or get you to a state where your database has to shut down until a vacuum has issued. So if you keep all of these things in mind, I think you will have a much happier experience with auto vacuum and it will get pretty close to the magic you expect it to be. That's all for my talk today. Thank you for taking out time and listening to this. If you have any questions, you can ask them on Discord. You can email me at sash at microsoft.com or tweet to me at the rate Samay Sharma. It was great uh, speaking at this event and I would I hope you find this useful and you find an opportunity to refer back to the slides if you run into any of these. Thank you. Bye-bye.